Sometimes, looking at the state of society in present ear, I find myself asking, how did we get here? And in that question, I begin to wonder, what if this all is just a giant misunderstanding? What if the mess we find ourselves in is just one giant cultural miscommunication? It sounds strange to say it, but weirder things have happened in human history. We look at the groups that make up this country, that make up the United States of America, and each one has a very distinct worldview, a very distinct culture that shapes their perception of the world that they see. As it's been said many times, America, and indeed the West generally, is beset by a meaning crisis. We're all watching the same screen, but we're seeing different movies. We're all seeing the same events, but we have diametrically opposed narratives. A lot is made about the black versus white division in America, but perhaps more salient is the conflict between the old school, traditional Americans and the new woke white culture that is coming mainly out of urban areas. In the last few weeks in particular, this new woke white culture has been in a mode of ascendancy, and it's been terrifying. I wouldn't be the first person to say that woke culture looks and acts like a religion, but it's actually scarier than that. Woke culture is the worst kind of a religion. It's a religion that doesn't know it's a religion yet. It's a perspective and worldview that does not understand yet that other people have different worldviews that are come to honestly. Looking at many of my friends and family members who are enthralled to this new religion, it seems almost impossible to wake them out of their convictions, to make them see not that they're wrong, but that there are other points of view out there. It seems like they are in a medium that's so thick and so transparent, it's impossible to get them to see even what they're doing, even what they're participating in. And this, for whatever reason, makes me think of a story from my own life. A story from a very long time ago that represents, while not the first red pill or deviation from the progressive worldview I ever took, but one that, for whatever reason, I find myself thinking back to more and more these days. Sometime, almost a decade back now, I was spending a bit of a gap period in between the completion of education and starting a job, doing what a lot of people did my age, and exploring the world. Having been to Europe several times, I decided to stretch my legs a little bit and try something different, looking to explore the Near East or the Muslim world in a country where I had quite a few friends, Turkey. I'd always wanted to see Asia Minor, to visit the ancient ruins, to see the Hagia Sophia and the mosques, to visit the battlefields of Gallipoli, and to catch a glimpse of the world that W.B. Yeats was talking about in his poem Sailing to Byzantium. Altogether, I had a lot of things that I wanted to see, and I was traveling at the time with one of my oldest friends. And altogether, it was a quite remarkable trip, made all the more remarkable in hindsight when I look back on it and think that no element could really be repeated in present year. This being before the Arab Spring, Asia Minor was relatively peaceful. My friend and I were able to travel far from the tourist metropolises on the coast and visit many inland locations. It was interesting to see a partially European and partially Muslim Istanbul slowly melt away into a more stereotypical Middle Eastern environment as you went east. At the time, I think I found it more exhilarating than scary. This was a chance to see a new world, and the thought of violence was really secondarily on my mind. However, even odder than this fact was the enormous ideological and cultural chasm that existed between me and my traveling companion. At that time, I had just taken my first steps back towards religion. I think I considered myself something of a deist, or perhaps even a C.S. Lewis Christian in the vaguest sense. At the time, I was holding these budding religious views in tandem with some good old-fashioned 2000 era centrism. A kind of comfortable middle ground that brought some right-wing positions such as a libertarian-leaning fiscal attitude and a pro-life sensibility, in line to a more or less liberal worldview that would still have me voting for Barack Obama in 2008. My friend, by contrast, was a secular Jew who had grown up in a religious household, which, like many of that faith, managed to combine a thoroughgoing Jewish traditionalism with a thoroughly leftist attitude towards the world generally. At the time, I remember my friend was also going through some kind of religious transition himself. 
Having already completed a trip to Israel, he was now incorporating a thoroughgoing Zionism and a respect for Jewish tradition into what had previously been a strictly secular progressive worldview. It seems strange looking back on it in hindsight, but despite the vast ideological and cultural differences, none of these controversies ever came up in a way that would threaten our friendship. We had grown up in the same town, we had had very similar early life experiences, and because this was before 2013, the difference in politics, the difference in culture, the differences in religion seemed secondary, less important. The bond of a similar individual background and similar economic circumstances seemed more important. And traveling through Anatolia, where we both stuck out like sore thumbs, the commonality we shared seemed all the more relevant, all the more distinct. We were Westerners of a sort, traveling through an alien culture. What was normal to us back in the West wasn't necessarily normal to these people, and vice versa. I remember that this impression stuck with me when we were traveling through Turkey, until the last leg of our journey when we returned once more to Istanbul, to the grand cultural capital of Turkey and the intersection between Asia and Europe. For me, Istanbul was one of the most fascinating cities I'd ever seen, and even now talking about it, I want to go back and see it again. For those people who haven't been, I thoroughly recommend it. It's one of those places where you can't turn your eyes in any one direction without seeing something that tells a story, that has questions and mystery behind it. And it's not just one thing. Of course, there are many monuments, there are many ruins, there are many things to see that are touristy. And those are all good, don't get me wrong. The Hagia Sophia is truly magnificent. Taking a boat ride across the Bosphorus is truly breathtaking. But for me, it was always the smaller things. In addition to being literally torn between Asia and Europe geographically, Istanbul itself was a city in contradiction. Perhaps it's a city eternally in contradiction, but when I traveled there in 2010, one thing stood out in particular, the cultural revolution ongoing between the old Turks, those seculars loyal to the vision of Ataturk and representing something of a dying cultural elite, and the new order, brought on by Erdogan and the people who wanted a more traditionalist and paradoxically more technocratic approach to Turkey's future. As you walked from neighborhood to neighborhood, everything would change. Women went from wearing hijabs to Western clothing back to wearing hijabs again. The looks you would get on the street from men would be entirely different depending on what part of the city you were in. And even the architecture and layout of the city seemed to be telling some story like this, although not one that I could directly figure out from my time there. At any rate, one evening, upon the invitation of some old school friends, my traveling companion and I were walking along the streets of Istanbul at night, looking for a restaurant on one of the tributary neighborhoods to the main Taksim Square. As is oftentimes the case in the city of Istanbul, we managed to take one or two wrong turns and ended up in a seedier but well-lit alleyway. Still, being close to Taksim Square, there were many people in the walkway, and crime was very far from my own mind. At the time, we were traveling behind a group of young men, shoeshiners by the look, who were carrying their equipment to the main tourist area. Now, having read all of the guidebooks and articles on traveling in Istanbul, Turkey, we both knew better than to attempt to purchase a shoeshine from one of these men. Merchants who sell unofficial services to European and American tourists are known for price gouging. Besides, being young people in 2010, neither of us even possessed any shoes that could sustain a shine. Nevertheless, as we walked behind this group of men, I began to notice something. The large sack that the leader carried, that contained all of the shoe shining supplies, had become untied. It was opening at the base, and as the group of men walked forward, their supplies slowly began to drop onto the street behind them, seemingly without their knowledge. Seeing the situation unfold, I immediately called after the men. I yelled back at them, hey, you're losing your stuff. After I'd gotten the attention of the young men, I then helped them gather up the brushes and polish canisters and stool and pack it back into the main sack. After it was finished, thinking I had done my good deed for the day, I prepared to go on my way, only to be stopped by the young men. 
Wait, 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 said the ringleader. You did something good for us. We just have to give you something in return. And before I could say even a single word, they already had the brushes and cloths out on my tennis shoes, providing a shoe shine I hadn't even asked for on a pair of sneakers that couldn't even sustain a polish. Don't worry, don't worry, said the leader quickly. This shoe shine, usually 500 Turkish lira, we give to you for 400 Turkish lira, which for those of you who aren't in front of a currency translator, roughly amounts to about 60 US dollars. A ripoff, even at the discounted price. Indeed, I had been bamboozled by one of the oldest tricks in the book. Yet all the time these men were profusely thanking me and lying to my face, they were smiling and making eye contact. It was bizarre. I'd been lied to many times, but not exactly in this way. And of course, when I withdrew my foot, Five seconds after they started, immediately the disposition changed. The smiles disappeared. The men became more menacing. What was that? You don't want to pay us for our work? Not wanting to get into a confrontation with these men, I think I handed over some smaller note. A hundred lira or about fifteen dollars. Somewhat satisfied but still disappointed they couldn't get more out of me, the men seemed placated enough to disperse, and my traveling companion and I made a hasty journey towards Taksim Square. But as I walked down the streets of Istanbul this time, immediately I felt a rage coming over me. What had actually happened to us? We had been tricked, we had been ripped off for sure. I had lost $15 for a completely useless service. But that wasn't the issue. I felt that I had been betrayed. It wasn't the fact that they lied and stole from me. It was the way they lied and stole from me. It was the circumstances and pretense of their swindling operation that seemed to insult every element of my being. It was the way that my charitable instincts had been turned to evil ends. It was the way that my attempt to be kind to them had been twisted to their benefit at my expense. And it was the way that they had smiled at me and looked me in the eye the whole time. As the night progressed and we finally found our restaurant, meeting up with my Turkish friends, I simply would not let this go. How could they do this to us? And why? Did these men have no sense of honor and decency? Looking back on it now, I'm sure that my native hosts just chalk this up to me being a naive Westerner. This was a function of me being born in a low-crime community in California, where these types of things didn't happen, and the world was a lot less real. But this wasn't actually the case. In fact, I think I would have felt better about the entire series of events if the young men had just straight up mugged us for our money. That, at least, would have made a lot more sense. I would have understood that interaction. For whatever reason, that violent interaction would have made more sense. And it wasn't about the money, either. As my traveling companion was very quick to point out, we had been taken for much more. Traveling across Anatolia with white skin kind of sets you aside as an easy mark. And it was easy to see that many a merchant we encountered was charging us much, much more than they would ask from a local. Hotels suddenly had extra charges for services that would, in most normal circumstances, be complimentary. Taxis suddenly had extra high meters that charged exorbitant rates, even for very, very short trips. For the most part, I had taken these financial blows as they came. I knew I was getting ripped off a little bit, but it wasn't really worth it to get angry, and it certainly wasn't worth it to create a scene. For whatever reason, I just chalk this up as the cost of doing business as a white person in Turkey. However, this incident with the shoe shiners, this night, was different. It was different in a very, very big way. I couldn't put my finger on why this was different. I couldn't get through either to my hosts or to my friend why this circumstance was different. Why this extortion, why this swindle crossed a fundamental line that should never be crossed and how their attitudes and their expressions seemed to be nothing less than a betrayal. I probably went on like this for way too long, and even after I came to my senses and decided to shut up, I was gritting my teeth through the entire meal, through every bite of kebab and after every sip of tea. Something was seriously wrong with this place. Even after we left the restaurant and said goodbye to my friends, I remember relitigating the entire events with my traveling companion, who had experienced the same things that I had. Yet for some reason, I just couldn't make him understand. 
To him, it was just one loss of $15. It was just an unfortunate circumstance, a slight inconvenience, and a slight loss of wealth. Nothing really more than that. I wanted to grab him and yell at him, didn't you see the way they were smiling at us and looking us right in the eye as they lied? What do you think that even means? And even over the next few days, I couldn't stop thinking about this. This country, as beautiful as it was, as exotic as it seemed to me, was weird. It was strange, almost alien now. Things didn't start making sense to me until at least a day later. When taking a solo trip across town, I stopped on a bench beside a mosque. As viewers may or may not know about the history of Istanbul, the city had been attacked many times by Muslim armies before it finally fell in 1453 to the forces of Sultan Mehmed II. To a Westerner, even a Westerner educated in the late 90s in uber-progressive California, this history was always portrayed from the Western point of view as a series of brilliant defenses against Muslim aggression before final and tragic conquest at the hands of the Turks. Yet the Muslim generals who died assaulting the walls of Constantinople are not forgotten. They're buried in mausoleums next to mosques across the city. And while I sat there and watched, I viewed an entire group of pilgrims come to one of these mausoleums to pay respects to one of the great generals that died trying to invade the city where they now lived. And it was apparent from both their mannerism and dress that these people were not the people from the city of Istanbul. They were provincials who had come in for a vacation because of religious devotion. I don't know why this particular incident turned my brain around on the matter, but for whatever reason, for a moment I began seeing this other culture as a place that could be a home. Now, mind you, I had a number of friends that lived in Istanbul as their homes. I was fully aware that the city, that the country, could be someone's home. But still, it felt amazing that the culture itself could be home to somebody. That this place, Turkey, was not simply the location for another set of rootless cosmopolitans to call their home, to be based out of, as the modern parlance would have it. This was a location that had its own peoples, that had a spirit, or as is probably the case for Istanbul itself, that had many spirits. There was a law and an order here that was not simply dictated by global currencies and eccentricities of exterior culture, the cuisine and the dress. It was deeper than that. It was a primal sensibility that emerged somewhere in between the friction of these people's own bloodlines and the nature of the living earth itself. Now, insofar as my own ethnic background goes, with a paternal line that hails immediately back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the forces of the Turks and the Ottomans had always been a mortal foe. Still, seeing these acts of devotion, seeing these blithe and totally sincere expressions of ethnos, it changed my perception for a moment. And I obtained a brief epiphany, much, much too rarely experienced, by Californians of European ethnicity. I was not simply some disembodied individual. I had an ethnos. Sure, this country might be weird, but I was weird in an entirely different way. I was not the universal human default. I was a bizarre specimen of mankind, something that occupied a time and space and wasn't simply conforming to what would ordinarily make sense from an economics and utilitarian perspective. In this light, at least, the events of the previous night made a little bit more sense to me. In strictly objective terms, my friend and my hosts were correct. This was simply one inconvenience and one misdeed among many, and I didn't even lose that much money. But my friends and my hosts could not understand my fundamental weirdness. The insane biases and weird idiosyncrasies that had been boiled into my blood by 1,000 years of ancestral Roman Catholicism. And, just like Dante before me, part of this ancestral Roman Catholicism contained within it a deep hatred for the traitor. The person who, with a smiling face, could look you right in the eye and then twist the best inclinations of your own nature to serve the worst inclinations of his own.
being a deist and coming off of a prolonged, decade-long New Atheist phase didn't make a difference. Not attending any religious ceremonies since a funeral eight years earlier didn't make a hill of beans difference. The moral framework of the Roman Church was here, right now, living inside of me. And like it or not, it contained and defined my own personal story like an invisible envelope. Of course, ultimately, in a primary sense, we all choose the faiths that we follow. But this is not the entire story. In another dimension, in another more subtle but nonetheless primal way, the ethnic faiths of our forefathers still choose us. Simply going through life as an individual, convincing yourself that you're seeing things from some objective default position, isn't really an option. At least not an honest option. And I think on that day, ten years back, I realized this. Telling this story today, I'm reminded of that old, famous children's joke. Two younger fish pass an older one, and the older fish says, Wonderful day, fellas. How's the water feeling? And then, after some time passes... One of the younger fishes turns to the other one and says, What the hell is water? This story prominently figured in a David Foster Wallace essay that I read just about the same time as these events, and that contains within it a very similar insight as the one I'm discussing here in this video. It's a lesson that I think very many people of European extraction, living either in Europe or North America, never really seem to learn. I understand that currently, in this year of our Lord 2020, the intersectional crew and their sycophants are in full force, laying out falsehood after falsehood, half-truth after half-truth. But for all of the bullshit we hear from progressives dedicated to deconstructing and destroying whiteness, can we discuss for a moment the piece of it that's true? People of European descent are radically de-ethnicized. We don't have a concept of ourselves as coming from any kind of lineage or tradition, by and large. And as a consequence, I wonder if this does not damage our understanding of both ourselves and our relationship to other people from different cultures. In many ways, 300 years of technological and cultural dominance have robbed us of any kind of notion of collectivity, and there are a few people in the modern world who understand themselves, collectively at least, less well than the modern Western person living either in North America or Europe. I speculate many times if the culture war we're experiencing right now isn't a function of this very obliviousness. Ancient ethnic and religious impulses awaken within us, awaken inside our own minds. We don't have the ability to express them in a productive way, so we seek some kind of movement. We seek some kind of political catharsis that will allow us, however falsely, to feel like we're connected to that experience of our ancestors and to a notion of a collective future. This would certainly go a long way to express the almost religious devotion that many atheist progressives have towards Black Lives Matter and the cause against whiteness. Those people who wouldn't be caught dead inside of a church seem to be reenacting some kind of weird religious impulse. And I wouldn't be surprised if this cultural lack of self-awareness even carried over to many of the ideological mistakes we have made in the West. In his seminal reactionary essay, Leninism and Bioleninism, the blogger Spandrel describes the emergence of Marxism and other hard forms of socialism as a giant cultural misunderstanding. Men from a non-Christian or Jewish background like Karl Marx didn't understand the implicit hypocrisy and pure symbolism of late Enlightenment declarations that all men were created equal. Without the cultural context to understand that this was a purely spiritual construction, Marx and others were ready to take this to its logical endpoint conclusion. So all men are created equal? Very well, then we will make them all equal politically. Hence, the more insane, radical forms of socialism, like communism, were born. I find this explanation to be cute and contain a certain amount of historical irony, although I don't give it much factual credence. In addition to Marx, who had a Jewish background, there were no shortage of autistic Gentiles, from Charles Foyer to Engels to Kropotkin, who were ready to make just the types of mistakes and exaggerations that Marx was. 
Nevertheless, even if this is not factually true, I still think it contains a kernel of insight that we should not ignore. Cultures differ in how they organize their restrictions and points of failure. As such, all cultures have their own set of very serious emotional taboos and also have their own set of hypocrisies, deceptions, and moral blind spots. If you come from a culture, if you're raised in it, you understand the hypocrisy as such, and you know how to navigate it. But this can be quite disconcerting from an alien point of view. It's like, for instance, going to a carnival game. You lay down your $2 ticket at the Hammer Swing booth for the chance to win a big $1,000 cash prize, knowing, of course, all the while, that that big prize is unattainable. If any carnival game allowed for the possibility of losing $1,000 on a $2 entry fee, with any regularity, it would be out of business in one night. But you still play the game because it's fun, it's a ceremony, and you can still get the consolation prize. You can look strong in front of your girlfriend and pretend like you've really done something for her when you win a giant stuffed elephant filled with foam and held together with the cheapest of cheap Chinese fabric. The whole thing is a ruse, the whole thing is a cheat, but it's one you're prepared for. You're actively participating in this ruse as a knowing party. The same would certainly not be the case for some foreigner who didn't understand the implicit hypocrisy of the entire endeavor and spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars thinking he'll finally win it all back when he finally hits the big jackpot. And the same things are true for larger societal dynamics. Was the American dream and meritocracy ever true, strictly speaking? Well, of course not. Jobs are political, and it's rarely just the best man for the job. Still, at least for a time in the West, the consolation prizes for meritocracy were still very, very real for most people. You didn't necessarily arise in proportion to how hard you worked, but working hard was a ticket to a better life in some capacity. And for most people, this was good enough. Yet somewhere along this journey, we lost the plot. We confused our propaganda and our principles. We lost the ability to distinguish between manners and genuine taboo, and we lost the ability to distinguish between the true religious and loyalistic principle and the hypocritically and cynically stated platitude. We allowed secondary considerations for things that really didn't mean very much, like freedom and equality, to take center stage, and let the more important principles, the desire to fight for the betterment of posterity, and the dedication to a higher good beyond ourselves fall by the wayside. This was possible to miss because we didn't really have a culture. We were just the default, the order and spiritual direction that had implicitly guided our lives and which had guided the lives of all of our ancestors would certainly always be there. We didn't really need to defend it because it was just common sense. It was just the way things were. It was invisible to us as invisible as water is to the fish that swims in it. In my last video, I talked briefly about the times that we are experiencing now, about the cultural revolution that seems to be imminent. Indeed, there are many things that are evil about this cultural revolution, but as many ills as we might lay at the feet of the manifest flaws of progressive insanity and Black Lives Matter, part of me knows that what we are experiencing now is simply the inevitable consequence of our own hubris. This is a transformation in American society that was a long time coming. The old order of European-American normality, long dying, is now finally in its last throes. In light of events that have happened this week in particular, with the destruction of public art and statues representing people like Ginepro Serra and Thomas Jefferson, many conservatives are lamenting a new era where we cannot acknowledge our past, where we cannot actually celebrate the things that make us American. But in another light, the destructions of these properties are more or less just an expression of honesty. The America that they represent no longer really exists in the minds of elites. It no longer lives in the minds of those who rule the institutions of media and education. As such, these outwardly facing cosmetic features, this public art that represents an earlier age, is more or less just telling us a lie about the country that we currently occupy. For an entire people who, across many generations, were taught that they were normal, that this was the default, 
I'm sure everything going on right now is quite jarring. It certainly is quite jarring for me, and I was expecting something like this. But after all of this is accomplished, and believe me, it will be accomplished. After Americans of the older variety go through their own five stages of grief, I think we will all be confronted with a choice. On the one hand, there will be the option to remain the default, to continue being normal by simply molding yourself and molding your culture into whatever comes afterwards. When the dust settles, new leaders will emerge, and there will be incentive to make sure that all of the economic cogs are squeaking along with as little effort as possible. There will be a new history, new standards of behavior, and new ways of speaking. Most likely all of these things will be required, but some people will make the choice to internalize it, to make it their normal state of existence, to conform what they are to this new system's desires. And contrasting this choice, I think, will only be a desire to remain different, a desire to remain weird, to cease being the default, to understand what was implicit and unintentional in the old world, and then to make it live once more in our own lives as something explicit, intentionally preserved across time. This will be the harder of the two roads, but ultimately I think it will be worth it. I can say first, at least very superficially, that I've always very much disliked the rootless cosmopolitan. This, of course, is the culture that I came from, the culture that I was raised to occupy. But it does now, and seems in hindsight, to be completely hollow. As the poet once said, there is no there there. And even looking from the outside, back to my experiences in Turkey, despite the graciousness of my thoroughly secular friends and hosts there, I always found them a little disconnected from the world that they lived in. For whatever reason, there was something more authentic, there was something more Turkish in the hijab woman praying at the mausoleum of an ancient Islamic commander than there was in the Turkish girl decked out in Western fashions, whinging about how Erdogan was turning the country into a theocracy. However, these trite and rather superficial emotional reactions aside, I think that there is something deeper in play. At this point, most people in the West are under no illusions. We have seen the full force of what many have called liquid modernity. The consumerism, the atomization, the soul-crushing compliance to the cult of niceness. Even if we do eventually end up avoiding falling into the trap of the pink police state, the pure emptiness of the entire affair is off-putting. Forget being a person of a particular time and place, I don't see how I can necessarily even maintain my humanity in what we currently call the modern world with all its trappings. And in the act of rejecting this, there is another possibility that's golden. More than anything else, I want a new language a special language that can uncover and describe the subtle and hidden truths that have been left behind by the force of global techno-capital. I want the ability to recognize and share what is truly weird, and I want that weirdness and particularity not simply to be part of my own atomized self, but to be something that is shared and held in common with others, with a community, with a lineage, with a people. This is what our ancestors once had, and this is what we might have once again, if we can work diligently to our ends. I know for myself, and probably for most people watching this video, this last month and a half has been a very trying time. We have become deeply alienated from our own society, and things keep on getting worse and worse. But through all of this, I think the first step in locating our own internal strength to persist is recognizing the situation for what it is. This country, for better or for worse, is where it is right now. This condition, called modernity, is what is happening to us. But, be this as it may, nobody can compel us to treat this like it's normal. No one can compel us to conceive of this as our true home. As much as it is a struggle to realize that you're experiencing some invisible comfort, some invisible normalcy that you're too used to to even perceive, it is also a struggle to come to terms with your own alienation, 
to realize that this is a foreign environment, to realize that your true place in the world is elsewhere. To contrast the famous joke and the famous David Foster Wallace essay, we, who are now truly fish out of water, must remind ourselves about the true nature of our situation. This is not our home. This is not water. And through it we have to persist, to struggle against complacency and forgetfulness, always with the hope that at some point, at some time, we will find a time and place that truly belongs to us.